Hi guys, I'm Sadie. Today we're jumping right back into Buried. We're starting chapter four. This is a five chapter story. So if you've missed anything, I'll leave a link in the down there to all the chapters that we've played so you can get caught up. But for now, I think we're gonna jump right into it. We were really on a cliffhanger when we last left and it's really heating up. This is getting so good. So let's get going. The ride up the elevator is tense. I take a series of deep breaths, doing everything I can to stay in control. Amy's gotten back to her feet, but her head is pressed against the elevator wall as she suppresses a series of sobs. I find myself trying to remember the way those creatures looked, but my mind seems to shudder at the effort. I've seen something that is an impossibility, a mockery of what I know is real. This fills me with a terror that dwarfs anything else I have felt since discovering the facility. I try to focus my mind on something else and remember Marcus's threats. I wonder if we'll see Marcus again, I say mostly to myself. Do you think Marcus got away from those things, Amy asks? Well, probably or I sort of hope not. You know, while secretly I sort of hope not, I don't really want to say that. That's, that's not going to help her, it's not really going to help the situation, I'll say probably. She opens her mouth as if to say something, but it simply hangs open. He's gone, I assure her. Don't worry about him. We have bigger problems to worry about right now. But honestly, I'm speaking more to myself than to her. So, I say, how did you end up here? She gives me a nervous chuckle and then shrugs. I used to work at the Pentagon. It was some pretty upper echelon stuff that I still can't discuss. Well, I assume this place is even more upper echelon, I say. This place isn't even on the scale, she answers. My other job was a cakewalk compared to this. Then why do you stay, I ask. Because the money is ridiculous. I have a 13-year-old daughter already talking about Harvard. You can do the math. So, Harvard that's ambitious or any other kids? Harvard. Oh, I know. She is a force of nature. Her dad ran off when she was three, so for a long time it's just been her and me. Amy pauses before continuing softly. What if I never see? Her voice breaks off. The words are too terrible to say, and her eyes fill with tears. The elevator comes to a stop with a slight ding of it interrupting the moment. Amy hastily wipes her eyes, and we waste no time getting back inside the command center. I ready the rifle, suddenly certain that there are some more of those creatures waiting for us in the hallway of the second level, but the way is clear, allowing us to haul ass to the command center. Once again, I find myself staring at the screen that shows my ruined work site. Okay, okay, Amy says, typing commands rapidly. This can't be that hard. I keep peeking over my shoulder, my senses feeling as if the monsters are sneaking up on us mere inches away. And then I think of Dennis, and I wonder how he's faring back on level three. Is he safe? I look back at the screens, and I see that Amy has finally found what she's looking for. A prompt on the screen says, Override of hangar doors and all level three locks requires clearance code. Amy types in a number with shaky fingers, and the screen goes black for a moment. In that moment, the words, Override, confirmed, come up on the screen. Amy jumps up from the chair and heads out of the room. We need to be quick, she says. We have exactly 20 minutes to open the hangar doors. So what happens in 20 minutes, or let's get moving? <sighs> 20 minutes is a fair amount of time, although we have to skirt the creatures and get back to the hallway and the thing and the stuff. But I'd really like to know what happens. I guess it's going to be like permanent lockdown? Let's find out. The locks will kick in again, she says. It's a security measure. I can't do anything about it. I follow her out of the command center and bound back down the hallway toward the elevator that brought us up here. Amy punches the elevator button and the doors slide open. We're taking the same elevator back to the biochem room, I ask. Those creatures are still down there. But it's the only way back down, she says. The other way is blocked by the hydraulic door that we pulled. Hopefully the creatures left. Hopefully. Neither of us say anything as we share a look of immense dread. 
we step back into the elevator and head back down to the biochem room on level three. Oh boy. Oh, this room looks like carnage. As the elevator doors open, we peer out, looking to see if the creatures are still in the area, but it's all clear. When Amy looks to me, her eyes are clear and strong. Marcus wasn't entirely wrong, Amy says, as we start walking back toward the hangar doors. Uh, about what? I ask. About how I'm partially to blame for all of this. You're right, you are, or why would you be to blame? This is not going to help matters. She's already blaming herself, whether or not it's justified. <sighs> yeah... Plus, I think if we say, why would you be to blame, we might get a little more of the story. And she's not the one in charge, so this is too much. We'll say this. Some of the things that we do here, it's scary. We should have known that one day something like this would happen. Everyone here with knowledge of what goes on on level three is to blame, she says. It's a highly advanced research facility, I say, doing amazing but risky stuff. So, yeah, you're partially to blame just by working here, but I can understand your dedication. So, why don't you tell me a bit about what does go on on level 3, I ask her. Are you familiar with the Large Hadron Collider over in Switzerland? I've heard the phrase, but that's about it. It's a powerful particle accelerator, she explains. Right now, they're using it to try to create what's called dark matter. It's theorized that this dark matter actually makes up a majority of the universe, but parts of the universe are, that are very different from ours. My guess is the people at the LHC will probably create their first dark matter particle in 2018 or 2019. But here in this facility, we were able to create one almost 10 years ago. It was the key to the research. Whoa. So... Does this have something to do with those things, or what does this matter do? Well, let's see how it figures into the grand scheme. What does it have to do with the things? Well, we still don't know all there is to know about dark matter or other matter that we have yet to even identify. These creatures could even be made of it, or maybe they're even some more exotic matter. We just don't know. If dark matter is responsible, there are no real answers to have. I scratch my head. So you're saying this dark matter helps with, what, opening other dimensions or something? That's the theory, she says. During the point-to-point -point transfer, the subjects are gone for three to six seconds. There's no way to see or measure their presence, but they exist somewhere. From what we can tell, they exist in this kind of void. What is that place like? Or have you done this with people? Well, I don't think she's ever gone through, so she's not gonna know what that place is like. She maybe saw glimpses. This is probably less helpful than have you done this with people? I would wanna know this, cause like what if these creatures are actually people that they sent through that it like failed, quote unquote, and now they've become these creatures and they've come back through finally. Let's ask her this. We have sent human subjects through. Almost all of them have returned successfully. I grimace involuntarily. Almost? Well, there was one man, Dr. Canna, who didn't return. We don't know where. She trails off, taking a moment to collect herself. I'm, I'm sorry, I asked, I say, feeling my mind start to bend inward again. As we continue to walk between the silos, we go past the area we left Marcus behind but he's gone. Maybe he did find a way out. I realize that we are walking very close together between the silos, perhaps trying to create the illusion of safety. We reach the exit connecting to the hangar doors where Dennis hopefully still is. My guts clench and my heart hammers in my chest as we open the door and walk through. I lift the rifle, but at first it seems that there's nothing waiting for us. And that's when I see the glowing, hulking shape to my left. It's closing in fast. Oh, jeez. Oh. Oh. 
the creature is about 10 feet away and it's coming quickly. So I do the first thing that comes to mind. I drop to the ground, making myself a smaller target and I raise the rifle. I'm not sure if I should just unload into the bastard or try to be choosy with my shots and weaken it or at the very least slow it. Shoot to weaken, shoot to kill. Dude, if you're going to fire a gun, you shoot to kill. The beast is less than a foot from me when I start firing rapidly. I'm not sure what's louder, the gunshot or the high-pitched screeching as the creature staggers. With that, it seems to turn and jerk away, parts of it appearing and disappearing every few feet. It moves down the hall and out of sight. Apparently, even several rounds of bullets are only enough to slow things down. I look quickly around for any others, but there's only Amy. She looks at where the monster went with wide eyes. Her face is pale, and I wonder if, like me, she is able to feel her mind trying to retreat. Ask her if she's okay or get moving. Um, we need to find Dennis. Just get moving. Come on, I say. Let's find Dennis and get through the hangar doors. Amy glances at her watch and she nods. We're already down to six minutes. How the bloody hell long is that elevator ride, man? We turn toward the hangar doors and I'm a little, little disgusted with myself because the bloody scene that so shocked me before now seems mild. Amy goes to work on the computer console by the side of the doors. She starts punching in keys before saying, this is going to take some time, but I thought you already unlocked it, I say. I did, she says, but for this door, there's still security permissions that I need to hack. Marcus would have known how to do this. She trails off and I let her work. Suddenly, something slams into me. I feel my feet leave the floor. I am literally thrown across the concrete. I look up in time to see one of the creatures. It's apparently in no hurry to attack me again. It's focusing on Amy instead. She's not armed. I need to come up with a plan to get this thing away from her so she can focus on getting that door open. It raises one of its flickering appendages, making me certain that part of its makeup is just pure light and energy. I could easily take a shot with my rifle, but my mind again goes to how much remaining ammo I might have. The only other thing I can think of is to get it to chase me away and lead it from this room to somewhere. Distract or shoot? <sighs> I really don't want to be separated. <sighs> but if I shoot, I could hit Amy. And obviously shooting it, if this is the same one, it only lasted a couple minutes. Not even. Oh, man. I think I'm going to have to try to distract it as much as I don't want to. Let's do it. Jeez. Hey, I yell. Right here. Come at me. I'm the one you shot your buddy. It turns to me, and I'm again faced with staring at something that has no business in this world or in this reality. Its body gives off a sort of glow around the central part, a bulbous core that is branched off into two humps, very much like a spider. Oh, yeah. Again, I sense that this visual information is not accurate, but it's the best my simple mind can do to make sense of this impossible creature. It starts lurching toward me and lets out a shriek of agony as, that makes my ears feel like they'll explode. Now that I'm sure it's coming after me, I take off running and head into another hallway that we have not been down. I find myself in an industrial area, and I'm pleased to find that the monster has followed. Oh boy, what have you done? Maybe I should have shot it. Oh, this is disused. The room seems to be an assortment of old pipes and tanks. I assume some of them run further down into other areas of the facility. With the creature right on my tail, I dash into a maze of metal, hoping to lose it. It's definitely having a harder time squeezing through than I am, and that slows it down. Of course, the room is not a cage of any kind. This thing is still coming toward me, shedding, shredding through the pipes as it rages. I notice that it sometimes breaks the steel girders, but other times it seems like it's somehow merging or changing them. Pipes that were separate are now connected together in a way that makes my head hurt. I finally get a good amount of distance between myself and the creature. I think it's lost my trail. But I need to get back to the hangar door. There's not much more time before they close shut. If I make a sound, the creature could be on my heels again. Hide and escape quietly or run as fast as you can. 
Oh boy. Fast. Let's do it fast. There's no time, I think to myself, I have to get moving. With no care of staying silent, I twist myself through some more pipes and I make my way back toward the door that I entered through. Immediately the creature picks up on this and turns towards me. But I don't even look back. I slide through the rusted obstacle course and sprint back to the hangar doors. Oh boy. Let's hope we kind of trapped it in the maze, right? Please be okay, Amy. Please be okay, Dennis. I burst back into the large room and see Amy still working at the computer terminal by the hangar door. Are you okay? I ask Amy. I can clearly see her battling for control of her faculties. Steeled determination wins out and she gives me a grim nod. Is there any sign of where Dennis went? I ask, hoping that she hasn't noticed his body somewhere. No, she replies. And it's then that I realize I have no idea how many rounds I have remaining in the rifle. This isn't a model I'm familiar with. Outside of some deer hunting, I'm really not much of an expert on firearms. Still, I'm able to locate the chamber easily and see that there are four rounds left. It's not great, but it could be worse. How are we on time, I ask her. Four minutes and I'm going as fast as I can. I was worried how long it would take you to lose that thing. Well, I say, I decided it was better to get back quickly than to... At that moment, the creature screams on the other side of the door. He'll be in here any second. Amy does her best to focus on the keyboard, but there's still no sign of Dennis. Before I have time to look around, a screeching sound erupts from the other end of the room. I bring the rifle up, in a shooter's stance, and I turn. With the hangar doors right behind me, and no sign of Dennis, and a closing window of time, I have to be confident. Yet when two monsters come around the corner, my body wants to shut down. The appendages seem to jump in time and space, reaching out for a split second, independent of the body, and then disappearing back to where they came from. It turns and screeches at me, its glowing tentacles snaking out of its body, and my knees tremble uncontrollably. Behind me, Amy shrieks. I feel myself losing control. My mind is sliding into the abyss of insanity. I pull myself back from the brink. I have got to stay in control. I wonder if they actually do something to you, like all that bending of the light and space and time and whatever. I wonder if it actually kind of drives you insane to hear and see them. Interesting. So, I only have four bullets, and it took a bunch to just slow that one down. But if I turn my back, they're just going to come at us. They're right there. Well, I guess if there's ever a time you've got to use your bullets, maybe it's now. Shoot at them. I step away from Amy and the hangar doors and toward the monster, ready to defend her. I ready my rifle, but the creature wastes no time. It makes that jerky motion toward me, and there's a sharp pain in my chest as it collides with me. Or through me? It's hard to tell. My instinct is to try to grapple or hold on to this thing, but then I realize I don't even know if that'll work. Try to get away, try to grab him. Hmm. Well, <clears throat> it seems like it kind of hurts to touch them, but we've got to find out. I mean, the scientist in me, which is not a great part of me, wants to know if you can even grab them or are they pure energy? You can't, like, hold energy. Try to get away. We're in a sp pretty small space. It's just going to go after Amy like it did before. Like, they almost know either that she was involved or that she's... The brains of the operation right now she's the one who knows her way around she's the one who knows how to unlock the doors whatever i'm gonna try to grab i don't think it's gonna work but we need to know i try to grapple with the creature but it feels very different from my struggle with marcus it's not easily grabbed my fingers slide through parts of it some parts like a ghost and others like a jellyfish touching it burns my hands but only slightly when I realize that I can't grip it, I quickly spring away and turn to face it. With a scream of defiance, I raise the rifle and I put a round in its core. The shot lands dead center and the light inside of it flickers almost violently. It falls back against the wall, issuing a hiss of its telltale static noise. Then it jerks away and retreats, at least for now. <clears throat> Another terror appears out of nowhere, screaming at me with its high-pitched whine. It bounds forward, charging in its strange, spastic way. I aim the rifle, intending to take this one out, too. 
I take several shots, but it's still coming at me. It slams into me, and I realize I only have one bullet left. On contact, the wind is knocked out of my lungs, and the back of my head strikes the floor. But neither of these things is as alarming as the fact that this beast is now on top of me. Its exterior is like a seashell that's been pounded by the surf for so long it has lost all of its edges and ridges. But the grip it tries to capture me with is pure violence. I feel those light-soaked appendages start to wrap around me. I raise the rifle, knowing that I only have one shot left. The weight of the monster is erratic. One moment I feel weightless, and in another I feel like I'm going to be crushed. I push upwards with the rifle to aim, but it is overpowering me. I'm not sure I'd be able to get off an effective shot. I see the core of its body, a spider-like shape connected to the rest by thin white strings of tissue. I know that I'll be dead within seconds unless I can manage a shot, but I don't know where to aim. This thing has already survived for so long. Shoot the center, shoot the tentacles. No, I think the center is the key. All living things have to have a weak spot, right? And this seems like it might be it. We're going for the center. Let's hope we can get the shot out. The creature is seconds away from tearing into my shoulder. I have to stop it now. I grunt as I try to angle the rifle in the direction of the beast's formless core. The appendages begin tugging down on the barrel, and it's at that moment I pull the trigger, unleashing my final shot. Thank God I saved this bullet. The shot aggravates it enough to win me some breathing room. I've saved my shoulder, but this thing is still alive and kicking. Oh, man. Then I see the creature extend its tentacles in a violet, whip-like motion away from me while it makes that static, screechy sound. The creature disappears into thin air and then reappears a few feet away. It's retreating. With a shudder and a cry of desperation, I get to my feet just in time to see the monster head in the direction of the biochem room. Amy looks at me from her terminal at the hangar doors. She looks petrified. I manage to help myself up when I see another figure nearing us, but to my relief, it is a human figure. It's Dennis and he has a gun. Are you okay, boss? he asks, but his eyes aren't on me. They're looking to the creature, trying to understand exactly what he has just seen. About fifteen minutes ago, I heard the door to that maintenance room unlock, Dennis says, pointing to the room that I had tried to bust my way into earlier. Oh, Amy says, when I did the override in the command center and unlocked all the small doors down here, including the maintenance room. Well, I went inside there and hid, Dennis says, and while I was waiting for you to come back, I found a massive trunk. There were a few guns in it, so I grabbed this one, he says, patting a shotgun. So, I'm glad you're safe, Dennis, or I'm glad you found some weapons. You know, the first thing out of my mouth would be, I'm glad you're safe. Thanks, boss, he says. Me too. Amy doesn't break eye contact with the panel. Almost done, she says. Suddenly, and without warning, a shot ricochets off the wall behind Amy's head. Startled, we look around, confused. Did Dennis's gun just go off? When another shot blasts near us again, we all drop to the floor. I look around, wondering who or what, come on now, it's Marcus, could possibly be shooting at us. Those creatures don't do anything that sounds even remotely like gunfire. And then I see him, Marcus. I should have killed him when I had the chance. He has a rifle, and he's walking towards us, an insane look in his eyes. You all deserve to die, he screams, unleashing another round that I hear whiz past my head. Dennis doesn't hesitate. He stands and he shoots at Marcus, causing him to retreat. How much longer? We don't want to get her to... This would, this would make me shut down. I would not be able to work. Almost there, she says quietly. She makes a few final key presses and then says, Done! The doors open with the noise of hydraulics and a whoosh of air. With Marcus pinned down by Dennis's gunfire, we start moving toward the doors. At that moment, another creature jerks into existence around the corner between us and Marcus. Shit, Marcus says, and starts unloading into it. But then he learns the same lesson that we did. This only slows the creatures down. Marcus gives us one last look and then turns and runs in the other direction. Dennis, Amy, and I climb up and head through the doors, moving on nothing more than pure adrenaline. I see Amy look longingly at the maintenance room that Dennis took the shotgun from. You get into the hangar, Dennis says. I'll get some more firepower. Satisfied with the plan, Amy heads through the door. We scramble inside, finally in the hangar. 
Dennis approaches from behind holding several guns and looking like a kid who grabbed an armful of Halloween candy. Amy reaches out for a 9mm with one hand. Dennis turns to me and holds out a shotgun and a handgun for me to choose from. Both look deadly. The shotgun looks more powerful, but the handgun would probably be more precise. Well, Amy took the 9mm, but she's not really a gun person, to, like she's even said. Dennis has a shotgun, and he's really injured, so his precision shooting's not going to be all that great. Maybe I should take the handgun. You take the handgun. I select the handgun and am comforted by the way it seems to fit perfectly in my shaky grip. There are more creatures coming, as many as a dozen. They're floating down the hall quickly, their tentacles slithering. A dozen? What the hell? Didn't they close the gate? The way their light seems to mingle together is almost beautiful. Close the door! I yell at Amy. She dashes to another terminal mounted on the inside of the hangar doors and tries desperately to close them. It's not working, she says with tears in her eyes. The terminal's disabled. Dennis looks through the open doors, readying himself to shoot the first monster that nears us. We should try to slow a few down, or should we just run for it, he asks. His gun is at the ready. Fire or run? Fire. We gotta slow them down. We know that Amy said we only had a few minutes and then everything was going to go back to lockdown. So maybe we can buy ourselves enough time that the hydraulic doors, the hangar doors, will close automatically. Start firing. I use my handgun to take several precise and calculated shots that splash through their forms, slowing them down. Dennis fires a shot into the approaching swarm and they scatter instantaneously. Just give them something to think about, he says, and smiles smugly. With that, we turn around and sprint out to the hangar floor. Oh, this is a big place. The room is enormous, so large that to call it a room seems silly. A large concrete floor stretches out below an expansive lofted ceiling. The area is almost empty except for one side which has rows and rows of metal barrels. Back on the far wall is a lit area that seems to expose more rooms and labs and machinery. Also in the rear of the hangar, I can see some sort of chamber or control center. Dennis and I follow Amy across the hangar floor. Behind us, a series of rough, slithering sounds tells us that the creatures have made their way to the hangar. Darn it. From somewhere up ahead, a loud buzzing noise sounds out. It reminds me of the slight buzzing that I had heard in the forest, the noise that got me into all this trouble in the first place. I look ahead and see that in the far back of the hangar a bright red light is flashing. There's a small hatch or door beneath the light. That hatch is open and I can see a shape inside it. I can barely make out the figure of a man standing there holding an industrial microphone. And as soon as I see him I hear his huge amplified voice. It blares down over an intercom system, and he sounds pissed. I don't know who the hell you are, he says, but this is a government facility on lockdown, and there are protocols to shit. I assume the curse coincides with the exact moment that he sees the creatures. They're making their way through the hangar doors. There are maybe 20 feet between us and the creatures. I act instinctively, firing twice as the handgun comes alive in my hands. One shot goes into the core of one of the monsters, causing it to jerk backwards. Another shot slows down another. The accuracy I get with the 9mm is amazing. Amy and Dennis take the cue and start fi fi firing as well. The floor becomes littered with a swirling white fluid from the wounded creature's bodies, but they are not slowing down. The alarm keeps shrieking behind us, and when I turn to see if anything has changed back there, I trip over my own feet. I hit the ground hard and in an almost comic fashion, sliding several feet across the floor. From the ground, I see that we have managed to turn back four of them, but I also see that my estimate of a dozen is way off. There are at least twenty. Their sick, dim light is sinister and gloomy. Their appendages seem to bind together as they come forward. My only hope of survival is that the man in the faraway doorway has somehow shut that could somehow shut the hangar doors. His voice comes blaring over the intercom again, broken by the booming noise of the gunfire that we're laying down. Run here toward the isolation chamber. 
I'm not sure how much time we have. I realize that I can sprint ahead of Amy and Dennis, or I can hang back and give them cover. I need to cover them. Amy has seen some crap. Dennis is injured. Let's let them run, and then they can cover me when I come through. <clears throat> Let's do it. And right now, I'm probably the best shot. Go inside where that guy is, I say. I'll make sure we don't have any of those things right on our tails. I'll hold them back for a while. I know it sounds very macho, but it also feels like it's the right thing to do. I have to at least try to give us some sort of chance for escape. So as Amy and Dennis run through the doors, I blast at the next thing that I see moving. All I get from my trouble is that static-like hiss and a high-pitched whistling noise. I'm able to beat them back a bit, forcing them to scatter. Each flicker of light is a small victory. If nothing else, I'm buying Amy and Dennis some time. When I'm certain that there is nothing more than I that I can do, I turn and run. I hustle, quickly catching up to Amy and Dennis, who stop and turn and provide me with cover fire too. There, Amy says, pointing to the small door where the man is stan was standing earlier. The swarm is less than 15 feet away from us now, so furious that they are pushing through one another to get at us. I raise the handgun and I fire again, this time taking my time to aim. I hit one in the spider-like part of its body. I fire again, this time taking one right in the core. I place two more rounds into this creature and eventually cause it to move backward. We're in the middle of the hangar floor now with the isolation chamber ahead and the monsters behind. Beside me, Dennis also fires. The kick of the gun jolts him, probably a result of being weakened from blood loss. His shot lands true, though, causing a jerking stumble and a flickering of light. We're almost in, Amy yells as we get close to the door. We hope that it will save us. Yeah, I forgot. A shotgun's got quite a kick. I didn't think about that. That's probably hurting Dennis. Crap. Um, tell Dennis and Amy to go first. Get inside, I tell Amy and Dennis, motioning for them to get moving with my gun. I open the door and I give Dennis a push toward it. He resists, more eager to try taking down another of the beasts before he makes it to safety, but eventually he gives in. I wait a beat and then I make sure Amy is inside too. I fire off a few rounds on the creatures that are still headed toward us, hoping to slow them down. When Amy and Dennis clear the door, I nearly dash inside, but then I feel something hot seep through my back. Roger! Dennis yells. The pain in my back is so immense that I barely notice the fact I am also being lifted from the floor. I look down and see that one of the creatures is using its flowing arms to grab me around the waist, its tentacles wrapping around me. It lifts me into the air as if presenting me as a trophy to all of its friends. I try to focus, attempting to angle my arm away in a way that will allow me to aim the handgun and put a bullet in its body, but it's shaking me so violently and its body parts are appearing and disappearing in a way that doesn't make sense, another oddity of this structure. I can literally do nothing more than hang there like a rag doll, hoping to be saved. As it continues to hoist me up, screeching its approval, Dennis comes back out of the room and fires off a shot. The bullet catches the monster on the underside of its core, sending it backwards and causing it to freeze for a moment. It releases me and I hit the ground. I drop my gun and again find myself unable to breathe. I feel slightly dizzy, but that fades when I see Dennis is still standing outside the door. He's firing into the beasts like a madman and doesn't seem to see the one on his left coming in along the edge of the wall. Oh, push him. <clears throat> I try to dash toward Dennis and push him out of the way, but there's not enough time. The creature jerks out of existence and then reappears right behind him. By the time Dennis turns and sees the creature coming, it's already drawn several of its appendages back to strike. Oh no. Dennis tries to raise his gun, but it's knocked away by one of the tentacles. A second tentacle strikes, and Dennis is spun around and thrown off balance by the attack. Dennis catches him before falling. A third tentacle wraps around Dennis's forearm, and I can see it squeeze, tightening instantly. The tip of the appendage passes clean through his hand, its blood-soaked tip poking out through his palm. Oh my god. Dennis's face grimaces in pain as he tries to wrench his arm free, but the creature's tentacle has his hand speared like a nail through wood. In a moment of dark clarity, I realize that I can free him with a clean shot at the monster's tentacles, but it would likely mean blowing Dennis's hand off. Dennis! I yell over the creature's high-pitched static sound. Can you get free? I have a shot, maybe. No, Dennis gasps as the creature tosses him by his hand like a puppet. Don't shoot. I can get free. 
I can't tell if he's right, but the other monsters are starting to encircle him, and I need to act fast. Wait for Dennis to get away or shoot Dennis's hand. Oh, my God. <clears throat> I don't know what to do. The other monsters are encircling him. If, if, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. I'm gonna have to take the shot. Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. I can't believe I did that. You decide to take Dennis's hand and save him. If I don't take the shot while I have it, they're gonna kill him. Oh no, no. In the last ditch effort, I try to get a good shot on the monster, but there is none. I will hurt Dennis even worse if I try. I take aim and I fire. The shot lands perfectly and results in a lot of blood and screams from both Dennis and the creature. Dennis's hand disappears in a spray of red and the monster's appendage simply fades away. It literally seems to wink out of existence. The creature screeches while Dennis hits the floor, wailing in pain. The reality of what I'd done sets in and nearly paralyzes me. Get him, Amy says, I'll cover you. I nod, still reeling from the sight of what I've done to Dennis. I stumble out of the door. Amy is true to her word. She fires off a few rounds into the approaching monsters as I make it to Dennis. I grab hold of him with my good arm. I drag him backward as, far, as fast as I can, nearly falling down in the process. When I reach the doorway, Amy reaches down and helps me drag his body with the final few feet into the room. She manages to pull off another shot, and when I look to see what she has hit, I see another dozen or so of the monsters. Oh my god. Dennis is writhing in pain, and he looks up at me. He's sneering. You crazy asshole, he screams. He shudders violently, sweat and tears coursing down his pale face. Oh, man, oh, man, oh, man, oh, man. Amy slams the door behind us. Finally, we're on the inside of the room, hopefully safe within what looks to be an isolation chamber of sorts. Along the frame, a little electrical lock beeps as the door is secured. End of chapter four. I can't believe I shot off his hand. You guys know I only have one arm, and I can't believe I made that choice, but <clears throat> I had to. I mean, he was going to die. I mean, what's, I mean, I, you can live with one hand, you know? I, I got one hand. I can live. Oh, I can't believe I did that. That's terrible. I'm, like, almost in tears that I had to do that. Damn. And, of course, he's, oh, he's going to blame me, but he, he was going to be killed. Oh, I can't believe I had to do that. That's terrible. <sighs> All right. End of chapter four. Let's see what our what our breakdown was, what our score was. Oh, my God, you guys, I had to do that. That was terrible. Self-control. You and 51% of players shot to kill the creature instead of just weakening it. Keep them at bay. You and 41% of players distracted the creature instead of shooting at it. Weapon of choice. You and 57% of players took the handgun instead of the shotgun. Judgment call. You and 57% of players disobeyed Dennis's wishes to not shoot, causing him to lose his hand. Well, I'm not alone. That makes me feel a little better. Only 41% of people distracted the creature that's interesting i wonder how that changed the story like if later when he said like oh thank god i saved that one last bullet i wonder if that was the bullet that they would have used if they shot at him instead huh well that was adventurous and sad and awful and wonderful all at the same time oh my god i can't believe i shot off his hand me like the irony. Oh my God. Okay. Well, chapter five is our final chapter. So next time we'll jump right in and hopefully we'll have all the closure and all the answers that we need. Wow. This is juicy. This is really good. This really deep and engrossing story. All right, guys, I hope you're enjoying it as much as I am. And hey, leave comments down below. Would you have shot Dennis's hand? Would you? Really? Okay, I'll see you guys next time. Bye.